everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. When Bennett Barrow's daughter was just a year old, she started showing some uncommon symptoms. Her teeth would fall out. Her bones would break. It would take the family 10 years to find a diagnosis of hypophosphatasia. But finding an answer was just the beginning. With his daughter leading the way, the Barrows created an app that brings together people from around the world with rare diseases. Please welcome Bennett Barrow. Bennett, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. All right. Thank you so much for having me, Pat. Uh yeah, my name is Bennett Barrow, and I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Rare Guru. Uh, it's a app that tries to connect the uh, rare disease community, whether that's uh, a patient or a caregiver or a special, special section with our teenagers to safely connect. Um, we launched that uh, last summer, um, and it's on the Android and Apple Store. And um, I'm actually in the financial services business. But uh, our 10-year health journey um, led us to a uh, diagnosis of a rare metabolic bone disorder called hypophosphatasia. Um, My wife was diagnosed last June, I believe, late June. So June, um, I guess it was June 2019, actually. And then it was a heterozygous mutation, uh, like a lot of these genetic rare diseases. And my 13-year-old daughter at the time, she was diagnosed eight weeks later. with hypophosphatasia as well. So half of the family right now is uh, living with um, this bone disorder and they're on the, I'd say, lighter end of the spectrum as the pendulum kind of swings from severe to to light, but uh, we're being monitored every six months um, by great doctors at Vanderbilt right now. But it took you 10, you went through this for 10 years looking for an answer? We did. Well, it uh, it first started um, in 2009, uh, with our second uh, child, my son, Hill, he just turned uh, 12, actually two days ago. But um, at 24 weeks, my my wife's water broke when she was pregnant with Hill. Uh, And so we went into the hospital and they thought that she'd deliver within 24, 48 hours. I got a steroid shot to develop his lungs. And once you know it, we were there for eight weeks. Uh, She was on complete hospital bed rest, couldn't get out of bed. Uh, So during that time, we learned a lot about the medical community, uh, seeing the OBs every day and wonderful doctors, very caring, but even day to day, they'd have different opinions. So we would actually have to get on chat boards or Google just to maybe sort them, sort some things out ourselves, especially my wife with her maternal instinct and the saying maybe the opposite of what they're saying. So when you have two or three or two or three doctors and four or five nurses come in a, a day for eight or nine weeks, you, you kind of learn, um, you know, certain medical professions and how how they um, uh, come to decisions, which was which is good and bad. But um, you know, it was it was great that we were in Tampa with good care. And then afterwards, uh, my son was born healthy. He was in the NICU just for a few weeks, uh, getting getting his feeding and some breathing down. Um, and uh, we launched a nonprofit after that. My wife did, where uh, she actually brings. Um, bed rest basket items and uh, NICU items to uh, we started over 10,000 women in Tampa Bay. So a lot of, wow. a lot of feedback on people's hospital journeys that uh, helped us in a, we think a separate journey to the, um, to the rare disease diagnosis and also to launch the regular app. What are some of the key lessons to come out of dealing with the uh, vagarities of the medical community? You know, I always tell my wife uh, and she still says it today when your gut and your instinct is telling you something's wrong, particularly women, I think your instincts are much better than, than the males. Um, then you need to get a second and third opinion. And that can be the rare disease space or even something else, because a lot of it's by the book and doctors can think about liability and really, uh, 
you need that second opinion because someone could be looking at uh, an issue through a, a different perspective or lens. And um, it's out there, but I think a lot of people stop at that first opinion. So that's my biggest advice from from where, where we were and where we are now with my children uh, healthy and happy and also my wife getting great treatment along with my daughter. I think that's a common theme across so many medical maladies um, that you have to advocate for yourself and you have to keep pushing for information. And it's no one's fault. Everyone's doing the best they can. But particularly when you're dealing with something that's rather rare, there may not be a set prescription for what you need. Yeah, and that's that's actually case in point, even a, a standard blood test. So after uh, my wife's high-risk pregnancy, not long thereafter, she had a, a thyroid tumor, she had a thyro- thyroidectomy. And then ever since then, she's been doing her uh, quarterly blood draws. And every single one would show up that she was low on uh, alkaline phosphatase, which is um, basically, in layman's terms, it shows how much the body can mineralize uh, calcium. So if it's very low, then it should be an issue. The calcium's, you know, it's not going to, to the bones and where it should. Um, and even LabCorp and Quest on every single one and just dozens of these blood results said, please retest. You know, this is an, uh, this reading's not making any sense. And every doctor, all the specialists would say, even second opinion specialists would say, nope, it's the high number you need to worry about, not the low. And my wife was just thinking, you know, she's a CPA. She's just, I, I doesn't make any sense that this I'm the only person with this reading. <laughs> it's just, and it wasn't a mistake, obviously, because she's getting it quarterly. Um, and that was, you know, finally low out FOSS is that is the number one signal of this rare metabolic bone disease. Um, wow. Yeah. So she almost self diagnosed herself in the summer of 2019 after my father got diagnosed with a uh, Wadden's from non Hodgkin's lymphoma. So my wife did, kind of self-diagnosed herself via Google. She kind of put the pieces together. And it took a lot of searching, a lot of misinformation, but after she kind of had an inkling of what it was, uh, facts and blood results to uh, Mayo, and then we um, kind of got diagnosed there. Um, but it was pretty clear that these blood results with a specialist, something should have popped on the radar. But if there's only 40 or 50 cases of hypophosphatasia in the entire state of Florida, they just haven't seen numbers like that or another patient. So it's not, a lot of times it's not, you know, they did try to look into it. They were just on a different path. So being rare is it's, it's tough for, for everybody, patient and even the medical doctors and community. Oh, it's really hard. Um, I was diagnosed with a really rare lymphoma back in 2009 and the local uh, pathologist gave one diagnosis. I went down to Stanford for a, a clinical trial and they indicated that I had been misdiagnosed. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I, I would guess it's not uncommon. And in many ways, it really isn't anyone's fault. If you think that there are 60 subtypes of lymphoma or whatever, I mean, how many local doctors have seen any of these rarer conditions? That's right. Yeah. So what happened with your daughter? Um, she was the one, it was your daughter that really um, brought this to your attention, wasn't it? With the trouble she was having? Yeah, so uh, we found out, I mean, it starts on the mild cases. Um, you know, it can start with more of the, the joints, fingers, and stuff that can break easy. So I think she was, uh, and also teeth. That's because a lot of the, the fortified calcium is, is in the teeth. And then when your bones don't have enough calcium because it's not mineralizing properly, then uh, the that calcium kind of drains from the teeth and gets weaker and floats around the system. You know, the body wants it to go to the bones, but it's not, it's not going there. So it's one of the first indications of the disease. But of course, you know, a dentist isn't going to know that a, a, a few teeth that fall out or anything strange. But when she was one years old, uh, you know, perfectly healthy teeth. And I think she was chewing on the soft part of a comb and her, her tooth just fell out, which is very strange. Another time I think she was, She's broken a finger a few times, but I think one was picking up a tennis racket or maybe a, a little fall and broke her finger. And yeah, that's that's a little strange for someone under the age of 10 or five or even one years old to to lose teeth that easy 
or um, and again, this is some of these teeth that already come in and you know they're they're falling out. So that's pretty common. I, again, you're with hypophosphatasia, you're there's so many different areas of the body that are affected, and you're seeing the specialist just in that area. So that was a little strange when my wife looked back at her records when she was a kid, or just remembering since she can't really find records anymore that she had similar issues that friends and family or mostly friends obviously had never heard of or didn't have. So Claire did kind of raise awareness to, um, you know, some of the issues that my wife had as a child as well. Now, is this particular disease hereditary? It is. Yep. And that's where she had, um, you know, the, the heterozygous mutation. One of our kids had a 50, 50 chance and uh, Claire already had those, those common symptoms that are associated with, uh, we call it HPP because the, disease uh pronunciation is too difficult but um, with hpp um that was um yeah that was part of it so how did rare guru come to be well, uh, this is a great question so my kids love uh this popular show called shark tank have you heard of shark tank the mm-hmm. it's with everyone knows it but you know, entrepreneurs go and pitch their business idea so they were stuck watching that in the hot dog days of summer in Florida. And um, after my wife got diagnosed, my daughter is very protective. Definitely saw how isolated she was. It, it wasn't like a high risk pregnancy where, you know, maybe a friend or you know family member, or you're getting tied to, uh, to someone in the community that's been through that experience. Uh, this was completely foreign that she just, didn't know anyone, even at Mayor or Vanderbilt, she could have been a, in a room next to somebody, but they can't disclose that information, which rightfully so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when she came home, I think my, my daughter saw kind of that isolation. And then when she got diagnosed, we allowed her on Facebook for the first time. She didn't have a phone just to a closed forum that was in general about HPP you know, there's, there's people in there with, uh, that are in wheelchairs and they're seven years old and they're talking about much more severe issues. And she, the first day she was very, very distraught. You know, it's a big group and it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And the information is absolutely correct. It's done so much, but for my 13 year old, that was a lot the first day or two to get diagnosed. That was probably a little mistake. You know, I thought she should learn about it and this was, uh, Googling it wasn't going to be good either. And that was tough. So she had the idea, you know, I don't think these big forms are going to work, especially with the disease that's, you know, can, can be one end of the pendulum of the other, rather mild or severe. She said, Hey dad, mom, what do you think if we developed a map, an app that directly connected, uh, uh, patients, um, teens. And I, I later thought about the caregiver uh, aspect and you can just connect with whoever you want to privately and securely instead of getting looped into one broad category. So that's kind of uh, how we started. We uh, got some referrals in California, hired a team in California to be our app developers. So it's been quite a journey. (laughs) Have you had, um, how's the app been received? It's been great. We were targeting at the end of December last year because we we kind of have the 1.1 feature, if you will. It's, it's kind of like a business. You got to continually evolve the ideas and what your users want. So we're get, really getting good feedback. We wanted around a thousand users by the end of last year, probably around 5,000 now. And we're not really doing much marketing uh, just because we want the new features to come out there. But um, the, and some great communities, there's a lot of um, you know, cancer patients, lupus patients, some you know areas that aren't, very large they're finding each other uh we have some in australia new zealand a nice little uh group of folks in england so it's um i think it was beneficial also coincidentally during the pandemic because we launched before but i think it has helped people connect uh because they couldn't meet up for a annual conference or you know fly to a center of excellence of excellence to, to be with each other is the app free it is a free app absolutely <laughs> yes um, any premium services being planned? Not right now. We're um, uh, right now. We are trying to build because um, uh, I guess the nexus of how it works is when you onboard um, and you can select a public or private profile. Because uh, a lot of people are, you know, 
very rare and proud. They, they want you know everyone to come together and know who they are, but you can be completely private and uh, uh, private profile, which is obviously with uh, you know security, we're we're very strict about that being a healthcare app. Um, and so is Apple and Google, frankly, to to even get into the store, you have to abide by you know certain uh, privacy laws. But um, you connect based on location, diagnosis, and symptoms. Uh, so our algorithm uh, really uh, goes with that primary diagnosis first. But we learned there's a lot of people that don't have a diagnosis and they type in their symptoms and they may match on symptoms and we don't diagnose. We don't have any doctors on there, but patients can can say, oh, hey, you know, I connected with you. You got these 10 symptoms. So do I. You may want to look into this or that. Uh, so that. Actually, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I think some people that were undiagnosed uh, from what we've heard, they've they've come up with a diagnosis just through the algorithm. More people are matching on you know, the more symptoms you have, the the higher you're fed a connection request or profile uh, to match with each other. So that's something we didn't see uh, as part of the app initially. But again, there's no doctor diagnosing, but when you get a, let's say 10 people that you connected with that all have the same symptoms, you can get on the right path. Uh, so it's, um, it's been valuable uh, in that instance as well. That's incredibly interesting um, and very cool that it wasn't planned. No, and that's it, it really came down to, well, first, how are we going to stream this information? And that was easy for the, the our app development team. Okay, doing a location that's kind of broad uh, by zip code because you can't use the specific data. That, that's, that's, that's an easy one. They're like, well, I don't know about how we're going to match people with 7,000 rare diseases uh, and initially 25,000 symptoms. How do we build this? So we actually kind of hire some people, CPAs, and we uh, teamed up with GAR, GAR, the Genetic Rare Disease Information Center, and they've been very gracious. Um, and so the data that you're seeing either on the website or on the app, when you enter that primary diagnosis or uh, symptoms, um, that is streaming directly from uh, the U.S. federal government rare disease database. Um, and then we supplemented that with Orphanet, which is a European database, we saw some strengths that they had um, that maybe, you know, Guard did not or vice versa. And also uh, Malacard. So we kind of a rare guru database that's uh, very comprehensive. I think it's the best of the best. And like, it's instantaneous and updated. And you now we're not doing the updating. This is this is coming from a, obviously a reputable player who's at the forefront of uh, uh, genetic information. Do people interact via video or is a text? How do they connect? Yes, yeah, so we have messaging, uh, direct messaging. So when you, uh, if you get a connection request or are scrolling with different matches and you send a, a connection request, then we kind of have an icebreaker, which is uh, kind of, you know, what's your favorite movie or you know, who's your favorite football team or whatever it may be. And then you can directly message each other and you can also include others that are in your connections and you can group message. So that's uh, been a very popular feature. Wow. You know, I think uh, on, on Twitter, there's a group of people, um, there's a hashtag called Spoonie. I don't know if you've run into that. Um, okay. It, it usually refers to people who um, have a, a wide variety of symptoms. They may or may not be well diagnosed, but they're often finding themselves as a result isolated, um, homebound, um, you know, very variable energy levels, things like that. And it's a, a obviously a very difficult place to place to be, particularly if you haven't had a good diagnosis. And um, that community would benefit so enormously uh, from an app like this. Now, that's wonderful information, obviously, being the uh, wealth management financial planner. I'm, I'm, I still consider my circle of competence in other areas. I'm quickly learning, but how many groups there are and how wonderful the rare disease, uh, you know, the advocacy is, it's just great to connect and talk. And I've, you know, I've not heard of them, but it sounds like a perfect uh, fit with someone that could, that could benefit. It's great. Yeah. It's um, you might reach out just using the hashtag and uh, when we're later, I can give you maybe a few names and people to connect with as well. Absolutely. Thank you. So where does um, rare guru go from here? Well, our next feature uh, that we're building, it's, it tends to be a little more complicated than we thought. 
But uh, if we go back to our app developers and we listen to our users uh, for us a little survey and what they want to see next, we are going to start streaming kind of a new spider. And that won't be like Google works, but you know, Google, you just Google, let's say a disease and it pulls up just anything associated with that. So just billions of, uh, you know, tiny, tiny areas that may be um, insufficient or, you, you know, you don't want to see or you're scrolling too much. So we're trying to get those 40, 50, 60 research org- organizations and, um, you know, maybe even the FDA, but streaming uh, news to the inbox that's pertinent uh, regarding your disease. So let's say you're, you've onboarded with lupus and, and you opt in for the news and we'll have those, those 50 organizations you know, the best of the best that the most recent and applicable to your journey, uh, going to your inbox, uh, on a daily, weekly basis. That's kind of how we're designing it. We're not sure yet, but, um, you know, people do want a little more targeted, uh, news regarding their situation that they're going through. Yeah, um, something like PubMed and even clinical trials could be interesting information too. Yeah, and that's we're kind of taking that one step at a time. So we think the clinical trial information that would be uh, that would be our next step after uh, we kind of build the spider, just step by step. Um, um, and again, version one point one and one point two to one point three, but that that is exactly our path. No, I think that'd be incredibly helpful. Having gone through that route myself. Um, there any help you can get in identifying good information resources is invaluable. Absolutely. And that was one path that you mentioned in the clinical trials, just meeting with certain communities that are, that are going through it or have been through it. It's, that's a very confusing area of trying to do the research on your own uh, through search engines or even uh, on social media. So that that's a great area where Mary, maybe rare guru could kind of stream, um, you know, cut out a lot of the stuff that's unnecessary or, or doesn't pertain to, um, to that person's rare journey. You know, there's a service, or there used to be, I, I presume it's still alive, at the University of Pennsylvania called Oncolink. And they actually will assign a nurse to help you sort through uh, some of the clinical trial information, which can be really valuable uh, because she has an insight that you, she can bring a different perspective to your search. She or he. That's great. Absolutely. If you could rewrite your story, would you do it? Well, you're asking a personal question. And uh, as you know, we've got the family journey. So the family journey, um, I would not rewrite. I, you know, it's it's even, and this is the, the words of my, my wife telling my daughter, you know, that this is, we are going to do something wonderful with this diagnosis. And it's going to uh, really shape who you are as a young woman going forward. And even this, this last year, because there were some scares of the pandemic, but seeing her going outside, being safe, but just enjoying and living life, um, you know, something that, you know, the, the difficulties she's already had in my life, uh, it's, it's already benefited as far as the current challenges that, you know, we as a society have faced uh, this last 12 months or 16 months. So again, rewrite, uh, they may have a different answer, <laughs> but uh, from my perspective, it's brought our family uh, much closer in together. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. You can subscribe to our free podcast at www.bumpintheroad.us or become a premium member to hear the full conversation. Just go to www.bumpintheroad.us for more information and to sign up.